Ladies and gentlemen, fellow members of the Millard Fillmore Society, <laughs> Millard Fillmore, as you know, is the only president to officially uh, represent the Know Nothing Party in running for president of the United States. I say officially. Um, glad you're all here tonight for the continuation uh, of this uh, wonderful series that we're doing with the Truman Library Institute, the Truman Presidential Library. Uh, I want to thank Alex Burden of the Truman Library Institute, Mike Devine, the director of the Truman Presidential Library, who's here with us tonight uh, uh, for being co-sponsors of this uh, great series. Uh, and thank you all for attending uh, uh, in, in such a, a great numbers. Uh, it's been great for the library. Before I introduce Mark Neely, who is one of my heroes, uh, his books are absolutely wonderful. But before I introduce him, I told him I was going to do this, I have something else to say. Uh, it's something that's very important to the library, and I hope for you, obviously this is a civic-minded group that as citizens of this city, uh, as taxpayers and voters, is important to you. Some of you will have read yesterday the editorial in the Kansas City Star uh, about Kansas City's development deals, uh, the tax uh, abatement uh, and tax diversion deals that the city is now wed to. Uh, you may have read Dave Helling's column uh, before that. Both these are in yesterday's Star about one particular deal where they're proposing to give uh, tax incentives. The city is proposing to give tax incentives to a luxury boutique Hyatt Hotel uh, on the plaza because they wouldn't obviously be able to do it, the poor Hyatt Hotel luxury boutique hotel folks without tax incentives. What you would not know unless you read to the end of the Star's lengthy uh, article, and you may not know because this is largely hidden from the populace, it's certainly never mentioned by the city, the city council and the mayor, is that these tax incentives are in fact not city tax incentives, they're tax incentives from the library, the school district, uh, the mental health levy, the community colleges. They take the tax money that you as voters, your tax money, that you have voted to the library, to the school district, to the mental health levy, and the community colleges, and they give it to the Hyatt Hotel, to Locked Insurance Company, the Country Club Bank, to Pulsinelli Sugar, our own lawyers, our own, and our own insurance agents, uh, and uh, Freight Quote, and uh, Sporting KC, supported by Cerner, et cetera. The wealthiest corporations and professionals in Kansas City are taking the tax money that you have voted to the library, the school district, et cetera. And for a long time, we didn't protest this. This has been going on for about 15 years in Kansas City. But there is a wave of this, a wave of this coming. And, and right now, the school district is losing on an annual basis. This is annually $35 million to these tax development deals, and, the, and your library is losing $3 million. And in essence, we're taking money from our Blueford Library at 31st and Prospect, from our Independence Library where the immigrant community, our, our Independence Avenue Library where our, our immigrant communities are, our 63rd and Paseo Library, our library in West Penway uh, in the West Side community, and we're sending it to corporations headquartered on the plaza and further south, uh, and they don't need it. And the city, and we're sending more money than the city is for these projects. Uh, I want you to know this, and I want you to know that you're going to hear about this more and more from me. You're going to be hearing about it from the school district, from the mental health levy, et cetera, because it is destroying our tax base. It's destroying our ability to serve children. Upstairs, right above us right now, is Kid Corner at the Kansas City Public Library, where we serve children. It's taking money from them and sending it to corporations that don't really need it. And it is a civic shame. And you as voters and taxpayers should know about it because it's your money that you gave to us and the school district to serve the children of Kansas City. Thanks for listening to that. It is appropriate, I think, after my tirade. Uh, <laughs> that I introduce Mark Neely, who has written so brilliantly, uh, indeed has won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, won uh, many uh, prizes from historians and, uh, and, and other organizations in his writing about Abraham Lincoln uh, and the Constitution, uh, Abraham Lincoln and the building of the nation. Uh, in his, his book, The Fate of Liberty, uh, uh, which won the Pulitzer Prize, 
uh, is I think one of the, the three or four most important books written about Abraham Lincoln in, in the last century. Uh, and, and that's saying a lot because there, of course, are, are a huge number of, of books written about Lincoln uh, as we've come to the uh, anniversary uh, of his uh, birth and the, the anniversaries of the Civil War, uh, a, uh, an absolute torrent, a, a cornucopia of books, many of them very good, many of them very good have been written, uh, but none, I believe, surpass uh, the fate of liberty uh, uh, in, in their discussion of Lincoln. And his, his latest book, uh, Lincoln and the Triumph of the Nation uh, is, is another wonderful book uh, about Lincoln uh, and the Constitution and the building of the nation. And one of the key things that Mark Neely does in his, in his history writing uh, is, is to write about Lincoln not from the point of view of the demythologizing uh, 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 instincts of historians of the last 30 or 40 years, but to write about it from a, a very close view of, of what Lincoln cared about. Uh, it's really a book in many ways about what, what Lincoln loved in the, uh, in the United States of America, what Lincoln loved uh, about the people of America, the Constitution and the Declaration, uh, what he saw in these that he thought uh, we all shared as, as Americans. Uh, and it's an extraordinary story. Uh, uh, Mark Neely uh, was born in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, he, uh, he got his... Uh, 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 undergraduate uh, degree uh, and his graduate degree at a small night school in New Haven, Yale, um, <laughs> where he won the Wilbur Cross Medal, which I appreciate because I have some of Wilbur Cross's books, actually, that I bought at the Yale Co-op once. Um, and uh, he, Wilbur Cross was an English professor at Yale who became governor of Connecticut, a successful uh, academic politician. Um, and uh, he is, uh, uh, he came the, after, after 20 years of uh, being the director of the Lincoln Museum in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, which I think, you know, explains some of this closeness to Lincoln the man, which is throughout his, his work. Uh, he became the John Francis Bannon Professor of History and American Studies at St. Louis University. Uh, and then uh, became the McCabe Greer Professor of Civil War History uh, at Pennsylvania uh, State uh, University. Uh, it, it's, a, it's really an honor and a privilege for me to, uh, to welcome one of the great scholars of our time, uh, Mark Neely, uh, to our platform. Well, sometimes I worry about um, talking about Lincoln and the Constitution as a, it's a controversial subject some places, for example, in Missouri. Uh, and, uh, but that introduction uh, eases my mind. I, I won't be near as controversial as that. Uh, I do want to begin, actually, uh, on December 6th, uh, 2001. Less than three months uh, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And on that date, Attorney General John Ashcroft, in a statement to the Senate Committee on the Judiciary, said, quote, to those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists, for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemies. Uh, and I don't know what you think about the powerful content of that statement, but I can say this, that you can draw a straight line from Abraham Lincoln to John Ashcroft. And in order to explain what I mean, uh, I'll, I, I need to begin with a text, a famous letter, a public letter that Lincoln wrote. It's called the Corning Letter. And I need to begin with a little background and um, uh, uh, s some of the things that led up to Lincoln's drafting this long and uh, important public letter. In April 1863, uh, General Ambrose Burnside uh, had been exiled from actually fighting the uh, Confederate enemy in the field after his disastrous defeat at Fredericksburg. Uh, and he was, uh, that was wise, but it was maybe not so wise to put him in charge of a large chunk of the home front, which was called the Department of the Ohio. 
It had its headquarters in Cincinnati uh, and controlled the military affairs uh, in the states in roughly in the Midwest, including Ohio. And as it turned out, General Burnside's approach to the home front resembled his approach to the enemy on the battlefield, frontal assault. Uh, Burnside was appointed in April uh, of 1863, and within days of that, he issued a public order that stated, quote, the habit of declaring sympathies with the enemy will no longer be tolerated in this department, unquote, which included Ohio. Well, the Corning letter, let me go back to explain its name, uh, the Corning letter was uh, Lincoln's response to a protest, a long protest, which had been sent to him from a big rally in Albany, New York. And the, the uh, protest was incidentally the first name signing it. There were a lot of names on it, but the first name was arrest is Corning. And so it's come to be called the Corning letter because Lincoln drafted his response to arrest is Corning and others. So hence the name, the Corning letter. But what the Corning letter dealt with was the arrest of an Ohio politician named Clement Vallandigham, his arrest by military authority. And the reason Vallandigham came afoul of uh, military authority was General Burnside's order, saying that the habit of declaring sympathies with the enemy will no longer be tolerated in this department. Well, Clement Vallandigham was an Ohio politician who was, well, out of work. Uh, the Republicans had gerrymandered him out of his seat. Uh, and uh, he uh, looked at that order and he said to himself, oh boy, there's my opportunity. I'll get up and give a speech in public criticizing the Lincoln administration. This Burnside guy, will, he will uh, s say that it is uh, seditious uh, and he will have me arrested and then I'll become a political martyr to liberty and then the Democrats in Ohio will nominate me for governor uh, in 1863 uh, and I'll become governor of Ohio and have a job back. And it almost worked. Uh, he gave the speech in Mount Vernon, Ohio uh, and General Burnside had spies in the audience taking notes uh, on this speech. Uh, he had, after he read what was in the notes, Burnside had uh, Vallandigham arrested. He had him tried by military commission. And afterwards, uh, Vallandigham was banished to the Confederacy. Well, as it turned out, the Confederates had no more use for him than, than <laughs> they did in the North. And so he left there, uh, uh, ran the blockade, and was then in, for a time in exile in Canada. Meanwhile, the uh, Ohio Democrats nominated him for governor, so in exile, he ran for governor of Ohio on being a martyr to liberty. And the letter then is Lincoln's way of dealing with this uh, very unhappy situation. The letter's published first in newspapers on uh, June, uh, June 12th, 1863. Incidentally, Lincoln had learned about the arrest of Clement Vlanningham from reading the newspapers himself. He wouldn't have picked, <clears throat> excuse me, he wouldn't have picked this uh, to be the, the military arrest of a civilian uh, on which to you know, hang his defense of the administration, but it had to be done. He was a clever lawyer, he'd had bad, bad clients before, and so he would make the best of this. Now, the letter, the Corning letter then, which answers the protests about Vallandigham's arrest. The Corning letter did actually five things, and four of them have been substantially ignored. But one of them is uh, rather famous. So the first thing he did, Lincoln, was to provide what we would call today a sound bite. And it turned out it was widely quoted at the time, and it's been widely quoted ever since. Uh, he said in, it, in the course of the letter, must I shoot the simple-minded soldier boy who deserts and not touch a hair on the head of the wily agitator who induced him to desert? So, uh, for example, if you read uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's uh, uh, Team of Rivals, 
Uh, that's the part of the Corning letter you'll see in there. But the rest of it, the rest of it will raise the little hairs on the back of your neck. The second thing Lincoln did was to lay out a conspiracy theory of the Civil War. He said that secession was a conspiracy that had been in the making for 30 years, and that in all those decades of preparation, the Confederates then were basically, with all that preparation, they were basically at an advantage uh, over the Union, uh, and it was because it was this long uh, festering conspiracy. Third then, um, while they were conspiring, the, con the people who were going to secede uh, had hopes that, Lincoln said, they could keep on foot amongst us a most efficient corps of spies, informers, suppliers, and aiders and abettors of their cause, unquote. So in other words, uh, when the Southern states seceded from the Union, they'd leave behind some people in the North and they would be spies and saboteurs and help their cause. And uh, Lincoln said uh, that these people who were left behind, they would be protected under cover, quote, under cover of liberty of speech, liberty of the press, and habeas corpus. So in other words, protests of the president's uh, policies, his internal security policies, uh, in the name of liberty of the press, that was, and this, this is a quote, that was part of the enemy's program. So if you stood up and protested uh, the military arrest of civilians and uh, maybe some transgressions on freedom of speech or freedom of the press, that was part of the enemy's program. You defend the First Amendment, that's part of the enemy's program. You criticize the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, that's part of the enemy's program. Fourth, Lincoln then went on to essentially criminalize silence. Uh, he made it plain that silence uh, was not good enough uh, as proof of loyalty. He said, quote, the man who stands by and says nothing when the peril of the government is discussed cannot be misunderstood. If not hindered, he is sure to help the enemy. And so Lincoln was now demanding a, a kind of uh, noisy patriotism uh, as a proof of loyalty. And he went on to say, much more if he talks ambiguously, talks for his country with buts and ifs and ands. So that's the fifth point. If you think about that, put yourself in the audience uh, that read this speech. Who speaks for his country with buts and ifs and ands. Well, the opposition party does. The Democrats in the Civil War did. They supported the war, but not if the administration changed the purpose of the war from saving the Union to what they, the Democrats, regarded as a fanatical abolitionist program. The Democrats said that they would continue to support the administration in its war efforts if the administration obeyed the Constitution. They're the people who speak with buts and ifs and ands. So the Corning letter then can be interpreted as a threat to end freedom of speech and freedom of the press and as aimed really at a loyal opposition. It's uh, quite a letter. Now, I don't want to be remembered um, as the guy who came to Kansas City to say that Abraham Lincoln was just like John Ashcroft. <laughs> um, and that, that, that's not the point of this. The point is, uh, my point is that it's pretty easy to find parallels in what are obviously different situations, say the Civil War and the War on Terror. And so what is it that historians of the Constitution can offer uh, that will uh, make this, uh, set this right. And I think that what historians offer, it's almost what they always offer, is context. And if you provide context, I think it makes the, the judgments a little more difficult, but it makes them more accurate. And so that's one thing you want to do is provide context. And the other thing that his, historians can do is provide some kind of comparison over time. 
And that's valuable because that then makes our, the context we provide and the conclusions we draw, it makes them fair uh, and perhaps more useful. So the second thing I want to do here then is to provide more context on Lincoln and civil liberties, and in particular on the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. In the Corning letter, uh, Lincoln at one point belittled the uh, uh, complaints uh, about the civil, traditional civil liberties in American people complaining about his policies. And so he belittles these complaints and he said this. I can no more be persuaded that the government can constitutionally take no strong measure in time of rebellion because it can be shown that the same could not be lawfully taken in time of peace than I can be persuaded that a particular drug is not good medicine for a sick man because it can be shown to not be good food for a well one. Nor am I able to appreciate the danger that the American people will, by means of military arrests during the rebellion, lose the right of public discussion, the liberty of speech in the press, the law of evidence, trial by jury, and habeas corpus throughout the indefinite peaceful future which I trust lies before them any more than I am able to believe that a man could contract so strong an appetite for emetics during temporary illness as to persist in feeding upon them through the remainder of his healthful life. <laughs> now, that talking about emetics uh, uh, in the Victorian era for an American president to do that, that was strong stuff. All right. Uh, and it verged, if you think about it, it, it verged on Lincoln saying that all of this protesting about civil liberties almost made him want to throw up. <laughs> it's very strongly worded. All right. So you'll notice, though, in the course of this, that uh, what Lincoln has sensed is that there is something about the writ of habeas corpus that surrounds it with a kind of mythic quality, uh, as though all of human freedom rested on or was tied up with letting judges have this power. And uh, I think Lincoln was definitely onto something here. And so I want to show you what I mean. I think the writ of habeas corpus does have a kind of mythic quality to this very day. Um, the constitutional historian Harold Hyman sensed this himself uh, years ago, back in 1973. And I think, if anything, the myth has grown even stronger since Lincoln's day and since, since uh, uh, Harold Hyman uh, thought about it. So if you look up the term habeas corpus in Black's Law Dictionary, and that's what I do whenever I see these Latinate terms in constitutional history, I go to Black's Law Dictionary uh, and look them up. And if, if you look up habeas corpus there, it's defined this way, quote, a writ employed to bring a person before a court, most frequently to ensure that the person's imprisonment or detention is not illegal. Then. The definition goes on with a long quote from a book by Charles Allen Wright called The Law of the Federal Courts in 1994. And in this quote, uh, Wright uh, uh, quotes an English jurist who said, today, talking about habeas corpus, today it is said to be perhaps the most important writ known to the constitutional law of England. Well, you begin to get a feeling of its mythic qualities when you notice that even in Black's Law Dictionary, which is a sober reference book, if there ever was one, all right, that it's cross-referenced with Great Writ. You look up Great Writ, it's cross-referenced with the writ of habeas corpus. So I decided to test this and see if there wasn't something sort of mythical uh, uh, about the writ of habeas corpus. So about two weeks before I came here, knowing I was coming, uh, I decided to read the what was called the Law Intelligence column in the New York Tribune in a period of about three and a half months in May, June, August, and half of September 1863, right around the time of the Corning letter. And I left out July, you notice. And I left that out because most of the courts weren't in session. Uh, and also because the New York City draft riots occurred in July, and the courts were preoccupied with pursuing and prosecuting the draft rioters, and so uh, it isn't a normal look at the, their business. So 
I ended in the middle of September, incidentally, because in the middle of September, President Lincoln uh, suspended the writ of habeas corpus in certain kinds of cases at that point and basically changed the rules of the game. So for this is about a 100-day period I'm talking about. I read this column, which covered what the courts in New York City were doing. There are a lot of courts in New York City. They don't cover all their business in this column, but they covered quite a lot. So in that period, uh, 100, about 100 days, I found 36 cases in which ju judges had actually issued writs of habeas corpus. Here's the actual thing in its use. And if we ask a question about the use of these writs, not based on the myth of the great writ of liberty, but on that cold-blooded original definition from Black's Law Dictionary, we can ask in how many of these 36 instances was the writ used to ensure that a person's imprisonment was uh, uh, really legal, right? Well, in the cases of the 36 that I looked at that mattered the most to the Lincoln administration, uh, the writs were not being used to demand that authorities justify imprisonment. In 13 of the 36 cases, in fact, that's over a third of them, the person in whose cause the writ had been granted, the person wasn't in prison at all. Uh, and they were, in fact, soldiers in the army. Well, this is something that isn't much known about the great writ of liberty. One of its most common uses before and during the Civil War especially was to release soldiers from the army. The practice went by largely unnoticed in peacetime. It didn't matter. But in wartime, this looked like serious business. So here's the background. It was illegal to enlist in the army if you were under 18 years of age without your parents' consent. But, you know, in the Civil War, as it turned out, there were a lot of underage soldiers, a lot of soldiers who enlisted before they were 18. And, you know, your older brother might enlist and head off for adventure and glory, and you'd want to follow in his steps, you know. Or maybe your father beat you and made you do uh, uh, difficult farm work with no child labor laws for protection, and you'd just as soon leave the farm. There were lots of reasons, but the volunteer uh, underage left and lied about his age. The law regarded enlistment in the army as a contract. And in the common law, contracts that were made with minors, somebody who was 17 years old today, those things were invalid. And in the law, incidentally, uh, these minors were called, technically, they were called infants. So the press, the press had a field day uh, with all of these uh, big farm laborers who enlisted and then got out of the army uh, because they were in their infancy. Right. So. All right. It was, uh, incidentally, it was easy to lie about your age and get away with it because there are no birth certificates. And so when you went to court, proving your age was a matter of entries in family Bibles and testimony of parents and other relatives like grandparents. And so you've joined up. It looked glorious. Get in the army. It wasn't as glorious as you thought. So you get a writ of habeas corpus, get before a judge, prove that you were under 18 when you enlisted, and the judge will lift you out of the army. The judiciary in America was extremely powerful. In the 19th century, it could stop an army on the march, and it could take soldiers right out of the ranks. Right? So um, it was very difficult for the army to prove that anybody had lied uh, 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 about their uh, age, and, and that they really were 18 or something like that. And I will say this, the judges were, judges are skeptical people, uh, and uh, th they looked at this hard, and so I'll give you a case, I'll give you an example. In Pittsburgh in 1862, the father of Patrick Kerrigan Jr. got a writ of habeas corpus for his son as an underage volunteer. He said that the boy was born in 1845, all right, so that'd make him 17 at that time, an underage. Uh, and the father brought into court a family Bible with the handwritten records in it to prove the boy's age. Well, 
the judge looked at them and grew suspicious because all of the entries in the Bible, uh, including the marriage of the parents and the birth of the son and so forth, they were all written in the same hand and in the same ink. Uh, and he thought they might have all been written at the same time. So when he raised that with Kerrigan Sr., uh, he said, oh, well, he could explain that, that the entries were all written by the parish priest. So the judge examined the Bible more closely, and he discovered that this particular edition of the Bible had been published in 1850, five years <laughs> after the alleged birth of the boy. So the father was held for perjury. Uh, uh, Kerrigan Jr. was sent back to his regiment. But that didn't often happen. The army was at a disadvantage in proving age in court. So to back up now and look at New York in 1863, uh, from all evidence, at least a third, in at least a third of the cases, they don't involve imprisonment at all. Uh, soldiers don't, you know, prisoners don't volunteer to be in jail, and soldiers did in those days. Uh, and it's a, a different thing. So even in, I looked at the other cases as well, and even in cases where imprisonment or detention really was involved, the person seeking a habeas corpus uh, should likely have fallen under military and not civilian jurisdiction. So let me give you an e example from the 36. Uh, this involved uh, actually two of them who were deserters from the army. So they have been arrested by the army. They are in custody by the army already. But if you look at their cases, uh, these were startlingly fraudulent men. Uh, two of them uh, were arrested for desertion when they showed up in camp as what were called substitutes. Now, in the Civil War, uh, if you were called up and you didn't want to serve, uh, you could purchase a substitute to go for you. And uh, you, could sometimes, uh, you could also pay what was called a commutation fee of $300 in lieu of service. Until 1864, you could do that. So what has happened here? They've arrested these boys who are uh, paid substitutes. And clearly what has happened is uh, they had enlisted first, got a bounty from the government for enlisting, deserted, which is why they got arrested. But they had, along the way, after they got out, accepted pay from someone seeking to escape conscription by purchasing a substitute. That's what they had done. And in such cases, the soldiers often admitted desertion. But their lawyers argued that they could not desert because, as underage volunteers, they'd never actually been legally enlisted. <laughs> and so the habeas corpus freed them. Um, there was a third case, and it's immensely complicated. It involved another one of these uh, deserters who, who was arrested by a policeman uh, and not by an army officer, and that was what was at issue in the case. So, but anyway, there were three cases like that. So we can say that in 16 of the 36 habeas corpus cases that I looked at before I came here, uh, they dealt essentially with matters of military discipline, uh, and 13 of them didn't involve imprisonment at all. So the habeas corpus wasn't looking into that. So in other words, what the writ of habeas corpus did in its commonest use in the Civil War, if you want to look and find what the average writ of habeas corpus was used for, it was used to get somebody out of the army. And so in its commonest use, it had nothing to do with imprisonment uh, or arrest of civilians by military authorities or shutting down freedom of speech or any of that sort of thing. And so from the army's point of view, it was the great writ of skulking, uh, and they fought it as hard as they could. Well, one of the things, when I looked at these 36 cases, I could also tell uh, what in ordinary times uh, it was used for, you know, in civil, in civil cases before the Civil War and during the Civil War as well, uh, what one of its very common uses was. And the writ of habeas corpus in peacetime uh, was used uh, three times in the cases I looked at, it was used in child custody cases. So uh, I'll give you the example I saw. And this will show you some of the, one of the very interesting things about doing uh, constitutional history is you get to see a kind of seamy side of life, all right? Uh, so I found a case of Mrs. Cora Duval. Uh, she was a professional clairvoyant. 
Uh, she had several aliases. They're listed in the record. Uh, and she'd been served with a writ of habeas corpus by one of her husbands. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure she had more than one. And one of her husbands wanted to uh, get his son back. And so he got a judge to get a writ of habeas corpus for her to produce the son. They're commonly uh, used that way in child custody cases. Well, of the 36, I'll just say among the others, uh, they involved uh, an alleged Confederate spy. They involved the editor of the newspaper called the Atlanta Confederacy, who decided in the midst of the Civil War to come north for his health. Uh, it involved a woman named Louisa Nash, uh, who was arrested on suspicion of having been one of the draft rioters in New York. And this um, Louisa Nash case was very interesting. Um, the writ for her was issued by a city court judge in New York named McCunn. He was notoriously corrupt. And years later, he would be removed from office in the Tweed ring scandals, all right? Uh, and so his giving a writ of habeas corpus for Louisa Nash led to the decision in 1863 that a city court judge could not issue a writ of habeas corpus. So in other words, the authorities decided to take McCunn's power to issue the writ away from him. So this isn't a case of unlawful arrest. This is a case of unlawful issuance of a writ of habeas corpus. He didn't really have the power to do it. Only one of the 36 cases that I looked at uh, involved a matter of freedom of speech, and that was a man who was arrested under a section of the Conscription Act for obstructing the draft because he circulated a petition uh, against the draft. And his uh, wife sought a writ of habeas corpus for him. So anyway, but one of them involved freedom of speech. And I want to say that uh, even though these matters uh, were uh, of the nature I've described, and essentially military matters, many of them, it's not to say there wasn't abuse and deprivation of liberty involved in them. Recruiting methods in the Civil War, especially for the Navy, which very few people wanted to serve in, uh, they were rough and rugged. Uh, and so one of the cases that I saw uh, b before I came uh, involved a sailor named James Brady who obtained a writ of habeas corpus from a federal district judge, and he claimed that he was intoxicated uh, when he was enlisted, that in fact they'd got him drunk, and when he woke up, he was in the arm, uh, in the Navy, right? It was a, a surprisingly common uh, practice. Well, the judge ruled, this man's name was James Brady, the judge ruled uh, not that James Brady uh, had had nothing to drink, but that he had not had so much that he um, could not be bound by the contract with the government anyway. Uh, so it's good to be reminded here uh, that uh, the tradition of enlisting, of, uh, of uh, enlisting volunteers for the King's Army in Great Britain, say, by getting young men drunk uh, and then getting them to sign on uh, when they're not in their senses, uh, woke up in the morning in the British Army, uh, that is a real possibility uh, in, in some of these cases that writs of habeas corpus are issued. Still, taken all in all, I think we'd have to conclude from these that the great writ of liberty had less to do with liberty than we previously thought. And, and moreover, I think we tend to think then of the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus as a sort of blunt instrument, right? Uh, and uh, it should be suspended only in times of rebellion or invasion when the public safety uh, requires it. Uh, uh, and when the danger of uh, sabotage and fifth column activities is very great, and you just, uh, just have to take uh, the, the risk with everybody else's uh, liberties being violated. Lincoln admitted that. Uh, he admitted in the Corning letter that that wrongful arrest could occur, quote, instances of arresting innocent persons might occur, as are always likely to occur in such cases. He knew that. But you know, I think he undersold himself. In fact, Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus, and I've never seen this said, I'll admit wasn't laser-like in its precision, all right? Uh, but in ending particular sorts of abuses, it was a lot more accurate than I had previously thought myself. 
and a lot more accurate than I think most people give the program credit for. And you have to read the small print, uh, but in, for example, the proclamation in the middle of September 1863, in which Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus in certain kinds of cases, if you look at what kinds of cases they were, they were exactly the kinds I've described. Men enlisted in the army, uh, uh, men who uh, were uh, under the army control for desertion and so forth. They're accepted uh, uh, from, these, uh, from being able to use the writ, but not everyone else is. And that's important too. It went on to be used in child custody cases, right? It doesn't threaten that the way Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. And there's another important point. It did not suspend the writ in fugitive slave cases. Now, in the case of fugitive slaves suing to get a writ of habeas corpus for their uh, freedom, the writ of habeas corpus was used for the sake of freedom. And that use persisted during the Civil War. Slavery uh, was still legal in four states in the North in 1863. And so the Fugitive Slave Act uh, was still could be uh, enforced. And so in this same period in which I read these 36 uh, instances of issuing writs of habeas corpus, I noticed that in Washington, DC, a court issued a writ of habeas corpus on petition from a fugitive slave named Andrew Hall. He had escaped from the, his, from the plantation in Maryland, and he'd gone to the District of Columbia. Now, in the District of Columbia, they had recently abolished slavery. So he'd gone from slave to free territory. But his master uh, came over from uh, Maryland. He was a man named George W. Duvall. Uh, and uh, he um, had the slave arrested. And uh, so the, petition, the writ of habeas corpus is sworn out in this slave's case. Well, it was um, immensely complicated. Uh, in the first place, the Constitution in Article 4, Section 3, which is the authority for the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, applied only to persons held to service or labor in one state escaping into another. It doesn't say anything about the District of Columbia. Uh, and furthermore, it didn't, uh, 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 the court, that issued this in Washington. Uh, when it was established by Congress, this court was named, get a load of this, the Supreme Court. Now, it's not the United States Supreme Court, but they decided to call this Washington City Court the Supreme Court, too. And then Congress gave it for a four-judge panel. So as you can imagine, uh, the, the judgment in the case of Andrew Hall was a tie at 2-2. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the bottom line is that on a technicality, they freed the fugitive. Right. So I have decided to rename the writ of habeas corpus, not the great writ of liberty, but the confusing writ of liberty. <laughs> and what I hope to do, would do with this evidence is to show how it was actually used and that that serves the purpose of providing uh, context and makes it less easy uh, to reach uh, easy assumptions about the meaning of the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The writ was an order from a judge, and as such, it can be understood only uh, at certain where it was issued, uh, when it was issued, and in what kind of case. So to a historian, that context is everything. Or you might put it, the devil's in the details. That's the same thing as as context. So the writ of habeas corpus was not exactly an absolute. And if these instances from 1863 are representative, then the odds were 35 to 1 that the actual writ had nothing to do, for example, with freedom of expression. It was unlikely, in fact, that the writ as actually used had anything to do with imprisonment. Now, I don't want to be remembered either as the guy who came to Kansas City to trash the writ of habeas corpus. Right? Uh, and what I'd rather be remembered for is explaining this difficult problem. And uh, in order to do that, what I want to do, this last thing I want to do, is to introduce the system 
that I have devised, I've been writing about civil liberties in the Civil War for about 30 years, and I've come up with a system uh, for measuring civil liberties violations uh, uh, during uh, wartime. Uh, and I want to use this system then, uh, as we uh, end here, uh, to rate several administrations. John Adams, uh, Woodrow Wilson, Lincoln, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, all right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to confess I'm a college professor and I can't help it. So another thing I want to do is to supply a grading system, all right? And so I'm going to give these presidents uh, a grade ranging from A to F uh, and uh, based on this uh, system. Now, the system consists simply of three questions to ask about internal security systems in wartime. First, you should ask um, if the system is proportionate to the threat, or is it out of all proportion to the threat? Uh, and that's easy. Um, maybe not easy to do, but it's an easy question to understand. Second, you want to ask, once the system is in place, is it used for other purposes, other ends, than the one of meeting the original threat? Now, this test has several special considerations necessary. Uh, we've got to pay particular attention to the use of the system to prey on vulnerable persons in society, uh, particularly those people who are identified by arresting authorities by their ethnicity. Now, the law professor Jeffrey Stone, for example, says in a book called Law and Liberty, almost always the individuals whose rights are sacrificed are not those who make the laws, uh, but minorities, dissenters, and non-citizens. In those circumstances, we are making a decision to sacrifice their rights. So as a part of this test, too, we need to ask whether the system is used to eliminate generally organized political opposition. That was the principal concern in the 19th century. Is it going to be used to eliminate the opposition part? And the third question you've got to ask is, uh, when the threat's over, did they end the internal security system? Uh, and uh, so whatever you may think, for example, of the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798 under John Adams, they had, as Jeffrey Stone, the law professor, points out, they had a sunset provision. They ended at the inauguration of the next president, which was two years uh, away. Incidentally, when I read that in Jeffrey Stone's book, I went back and looked at Lincoln's proclamation suspending the writ of habeas corpus, and I noticed that they all uh, applied only during the existing insurrection. So they're supposed to have a sunset provision. Now, as for grades, quickly, um, I'll assign F to anyone who becomes a dictator. All right? uh, now, uh, that would be by not ending the internal security system uh, when the threat was over. Uh, obviously, no one's going to get an F. Uh, I am a notoriously tough grader at Penn State. Uh, I do give Fs, but not tonight. All right? So nobody gets an F. But otherwise, the full range of grades from uh, D to A, uh, that full range is available. So I would give uh, John Adams a D for overseeing the Alien and Sedition Acts of 1798. He fails the provocation test. The Alien and Sedition Acts uh, arose because not of a war, but of only what was called a quasi-war, a naval war with France, fought entirely on the seas. The United States lost a lot of ships in it, but there was no threat on land at all. Um, and so the Alien and Sedition Acts were not used uh, to attack France, obviously, but to attack civil liberties at home. Uh, and at that, they were very efficient. Here are the facts. Under the Sedition Act, 25 people were arrested, 14 were indicted, 10 were tried and uh, convicted. So it doesn't sound like a great number, 25, until you learn that almost all of them were editors or writers for Thomas Jefferson-oriented newspapers. 
Now there were in the whole country at the time, as Michael Schutzen, the, the, the uh, uh, media historian, uh, says, there were only about 200 newspapers. Perhaps a quarter of them were identified with the Jeffersonian cause. And so what the Alien and Sedition Acts did then uh, was to arrest maybe as many as half of the opposition newspaper writers and editors. And that is a serious threat to the loyal uh, opposition. It's a full-scale assault on the opposition party, not on France. Uh, and, uh, you know, since a newspaper was the one essential thing that a political party had to have uh, to attack the newspapers was, uh, was very serious. The Adams administration, though, does pass the um, sunset test, of course. Well, Woodrow Wilson, I give Woodrow Wilson a C minus. Now, he rates above Adams in part because Wilson uh, doesn't fail the provocations test altogether. He dealt with a real war, World War I, but it was a decidedly foreign war, uh, offering little threat to what we now call the homeland. Uh, the system under Wilson was, however, uh, so it was really aimed at sedition and espionage in some cases. Uh, but it, it uh, fails the uh, victim's test, the collateral damage test. Under the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917 and 1918, the Wilson administration conducted 2,168 trials and brought 1,055 1, convictions. Uh, and these were, we can tell what they were aimed at among people who were uh, convicted uh, under the Espionage Acts were 150 leaders of the industrial workers of the world. Uh, the administration also failed the victim's test in another way. It arrested some 6,300 enemy aliens, and it met draft resistance this way. It uh, allowed with sort of government help uh, a kind of quasi-public quasi-vigilante organization called the American Protective League, it allowed them to conduct raids in which, during the war, some 40,000 individuals were detained. They would sweep down on the, on the cheap hotels, and any uh, person in there who was of draft age, they just arrested them uh, and, and held them in custody. And I think almost all writers on the Wilson administration acknowledged that the program was used to attack radical political movements, and especially the American Socialist uh, Party. Uh, and it's also true that the Wilson administration doesn't really quite pass the sunset test because uh, the system, not exactly the same way, but the system, the spirit of it kind of carried over into the Red Scare after the war. Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gets a D. His uh, policies were, of course, uh, had great provocation in a way, uh, World War II, and it did include a Japanese attack on United States territory. And if you read John Lewis uh, Gaddis, he makes an important point in his book called Surprise Security and the American Experience that attacks on the United States have been very rare and surprise attacks even rarer than that. It's essentially the United States has been attacked uh, only three times. Uh, in 1814, when the British burned the capital in the War of 1812, uh, when uh, in Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, and then, of course, in 9-11. But, of course, the people actually targeted by Roosevelt's internal security system, Japanese Americans, offered no provocation themselves by way of spying or espionage. Uh, the provocation, if there had been any, was already removed, as Jeffrey Stone points out, uh, before Roosevelt acted. The FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, had already arrested all of the persons he thought, uh, that he suspected, of being possible spies for Japan before the program was put in place. He opposed it as useless. Right? Uh, and the Roosevelt, the uh, administration, therefore, uh, fails the victim's test, especially because the identification of the enemy in this instance was by skin color, not by their likelihood to threaten national security. It's notorious, of course, that the Roosevelt administration did not put German Americans and did not put Italian Americans in concentration camps, as it did Japanese Americans. Uh, Roosevelt does pass the sunset test uh, because he ordered an end to the system uh, before the end of the war. 
But uh, to balance that appraisal, uh, we want to remember that the system was planned before the war started in 1936 by the Navy Department. That's five years before the attack on Pearl Harbor. They planned what were then called concentration camps for Japanese Americans. Uh, but when the plan was finally carried out and 120,000 persons uh, were put in, they were put in relocation centers instead of concentration camps. Okay, so these comparisons, I think that's what, I, I think the system is important to let us uh, understand uh, the suspension of civil liberties in wartime. Uh, I think they mostly provide a, a contrast with the Lincoln administration. Uh, President Lincoln did admit that mistakes could be made, uh, that the system was, uh, there could be accidents occur, uh, and it might have been an accident prone system, but the whole system uh, was not a mistake, uh, as was the um, detention of Japanese Americans. So the last question remains then, what grade do we assign Abraham Lincoln? Over the years, he's been assigned all the grades from F to A. Uh, it's surprising that he got an F, but there were people, even famous people, like the literary critic Edmund Wilson, who said that Lincoln was a dictator uh, and uh, compared him to Bismarck and uh, Lenin. Uh, modern historians, I think, agree with that. Uh, and the crucial point to remember there was made by Harold Hyman back in 1977 who said that the most important thing to know about the election of 1864, the presidential election in the midst of the war, the most important thing to know about it is that it was held. Uh, so uh, no dictator, with potential dictator is going to miss an opportunity uh, uh, to postpone the election. But that still leaves the whole range of grades above F. Uh, and we have to remember, of course, that there's no sunset test for Lincoln because uh, he was murdered before he could have ended the internal security system. So taken all in all, uh, you want to remember that under the Lincoln administration, uh, 15,000 or more civilians were arrested by military authority. Uh, and so I think I'll end with a question and not an answer. What grade would you give Abraham Lincoln?